Welcome to UCF Imprint. I'm Alice Collier. It's your worst nightmare. You watch as your mother inadvertently wakes a vicious fire breathing dragon from its century long slumber. Now fast forward 20 years and now the entire world has been taken over by these nasty beasts. All humanity struggles to survive. Everything is coming to an end. You wake up in a panic and realize it was all just a dream. In fact, the storyline of a Hollywood movie. You think dragons aren't for real. They never were, right? Well, let's hear what my guest thinks about that. UCF professor of anthropology, Dr. David E. Jones, has written several books, including this one called An Instinct for dragons. Welcome, David. Thank you. So, are dragons real or not? Uh, the dragon, the classic dragon, never was real. I'm pretty sure of that. Um, but I also am pretty sure about why we think they were and why we think they are, uh, and why you find this image of this monster basically the same image all over the world. Okay, why is that? I mean, from the oh, beginning of time, like yes, that, rebel that, in the Bible. Well. Oh, way before that, way I also before. think, yeah. I, well, it's, it's complicated in a sense, but how I got at it was I was studying uh, some literature on howler monkeys for one of my anthropology class. Now, what are those? Well, this is just a typical, I, I wanted to find just a typical monkey monkey. Okay. You know, usually I was working with chimpanzees, but I decided howler monkeys. So I was making notes, and it, it hit this interesting description that said that the howler monkeys have three distinct calls to which they respond. One is the, uh, a monkey call that basically says, there's a snake here. And uh, when they make that call, the, the howler monkeys will stand up on their hind legs and look, at the, look down mm -hmm. at the ground. And then they'll run up into the trees, way up high into the trees. Uh, they have another call that basically is the call for a raptor or like hunting bird. Mm. And as soon as that, they hear that call, these howler monkeys instinctively they're not taught this, they just, this is in, in them, and that's what gave me the clue. Instinctively, we'll jump right out of a tree and hit the ground and run into a bush uh -huh. because the eagles can't chase them into the bushes. And then there's another call that means uh, leopard or big carnivore in the territory. Howler monkeys instinctively at that point will run up into a tree and then out on the thinnest branches, you know, but where the leopard can climb, but they can't climb on little thin branches. So I thought that, you know, that's, that was kind of fascinating. Then I went on to note that there were, I read there were like 28 calls of the howler monkeys, but none of them elicited this, this instinctual response. In other this words, fear. Well, and, and that a certain, that a snake call, a raptor call, or a leopard call would make them do certain things, and it was instinctive. And I was kind of thinking, you know, that's kind of interesting. And I was closing the book and, uh, to go about my business, and. Uh, the, the page that I was looking at as I closed the book, it's the title of the, of the, of the picture said, uh, Predators of the Howler Monkeys. And then it had a picture of a leopard and a picture of an eagle and a picture of a snake. And as I closed mm. the book, uh, this is sort of the aha response, where they all went together and I said, that's a dragon. You know, it's like mm. I just, it's, it's like, you, you, very often in, in scientific research, you get the answer before you figure out the question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's, I, it occurred to me that if uh, that all, the dragon is basically a com somehow a combination of a scaly, flying, taloned creature, you know, like that, and that was the, the that was the uh, the raptor and the snake and the and the leopard. So and it's then, an umbrella term. Well, then is it? no. Well, then what I had to figure out then was. Is this true everywhere? Because if it was just true of African howler monkeys, it would be just minorly interesting. But what I found is everywhere you find arboreal primates, in other words, the monkeys, and then all the way back in time, the little creatures called tarsiers and lemurs and whatnot, our ancestors. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you look into the Philippines, and you look into South America, and you look into Africa and India, it's always the same thing. Is that where, anywhere in the world that you find arboreal primates, that is climbing monkeys and climbing animals like this, you're gonna find that there's gonna be the eagle, the snake, and the, and the carnivore, the leopard or the civet cat. Mm. It's gonna be in the area, and they're gonna be the major predators. So then I started thinking about how, well, this is where we come from. In other words, mm -hmm. in terms of how our, our body is built, we're built as the tree climbers. And in, in terms of the fossil record, I mean, the, we go back to like the little tarsiers and lemurs about this big that have like us flat fingernails and five digit fingers and stuff like that. So f way before our line even began historically to develop, there was this, this life and death struggle between these little tree dwelling creatures and snakes and raptors and cats. Mm -hmm. So the idea was, is the, the idea of natural selection is that these animals, these predators will attack, uh, studies have shown maybe 10 times a day 
Usually they miss. The leopard usually misses the attack, and the eagle usually misses, but they often hit. Uh, now, for the little creatures in the trees that are insensitive to, let's say, a particular terror sound that means an eagle, uh, that, you know, they, they hear the sound that means eagle coming from one of their compatriots, and they say, what? And of course, bang, they're nailed, they're dead, their mm -hmm. genes are gone. But those that have a, because of the range of sensitivity to sound that we all have, or to smell, or to fear, or to light, those who are, who are a little bit more p genetically set up to perceive the fear will survive. They pass on their genes. And so you, what you have is that you have this natural selection. These predators are sort of grooming the arboreal primates mm -hmm. to pay attention to them, to fear them, and to react to them like this. And so I think that in time, uh, as the development and, and history of our kind grows, is that this, uh, this sort of, it became inbred, instinctual, that when you are involved with snakes, like a lot of people are afraid of snakes and never even seen them. There's a psychiatric yeah. term of phidiophobia. And, uh, and likewise. That's me. <laughs> are you a, a ophidiophobiac? <laughs> and then it's the same thing with snakes. I mean, a lot of people just, you know, snakes get them and, and uh, big, you know, big dogs or big animals mm -hmm. scare them like that. Why? You know, there's because no, nobody's had experience with this type of thing, but little children w will grow up and they'll have these kind of fears to fluttering things in their face, right. like birds, you know, or, you know, slithering things like this. And um, so they're taught those fears? No, 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 no. It, they are caused by natural selection. Mm -hmm. In other words, I over see. a great time in our ancestors until it gets to us. Now, as we get larger, as our ancestors got larger, we, for example, uh, a leopard today in Africa, if confronted with a troop of chimpanzees, will not attack them. I mean, the, mm. the, the, the bigger apes in, in group activity can take on any predator. Mm -hmm. All right, but you just don't, after spending millions of years of, evo of evolving this reacting, reaction to these predators, uh, you just don't then do away with them. They're, they're there, mm -hmm. see? And then what happens, though, is when the brain has basically gone through learning, in this case through natural selection and whatnot, and then it suddenly does not need that learning anymore. What the the, the brain uh, f uh, fix its, f fixes a number of items into a single category, like with a file. So they have so you have call for snake, uh, call for for a leopard, call for predator, mm -hmm. uh, bird, raptor, eagle, mm -hmm. hawk. Then you collapse them. Say with a, with a file. It's like the way the brain works, and the mm -hmm. file says well, the word that we we use dragon. And so. I, that uh, that is where the dragon came from. Um, now, it, it is since all of our human history is based on the same kind of animals, which are arboreal primates. Mm -hmm. It means that all of the uh, our arboreal primates of the world, and most importantly, we are also from arboreal primates. All of us, all the people of the world, have this. I believe this file that says be terribly afraid of, the, of big cats, big snakes, and big mm. birds lumped together, monster, okay? And it happens to be what we call a dragon. I think that's why, that explains why, the, the, even though the dragon never existed, this fi there was, no, there was mm. no fire breathing anything out there, but everybody in the world thinks it, th it, thinks it does or feels that it does or reacts this way. Well, when you say that word, you know, when you say dragon to mm -hmm. me, I envision just that, like a snake-looking serpent thing. When I say, what I got into, I offer in the book a number of images, is that the dragon is a flight-capable uh, reptilian uh, uh, animal with big teeth and a, and, a mu and a big muzzle. I mean, if you look at it, it's got horns, too, if, if you study the dragon. Likewise, it, the hands of the dragon are talons. I mean, mm -hmm. they're bird, bird attack situations. If you look at pictures of dragons, they will never have like a, like a cat's paw. It's like a, sh a short pad with little claws come out like this. Talons come out like this. And the mm -hmm. dragons will generally be depicted like this. So now, why they look different, is so somewhat different, is that every culture in the world has its own method of aesthetic presentation, how to draw, how mm -hmm. to, how to uh, imagine what looks like scales or what looks like horns. But once you get the idea that you're looking at a composite creature, and this is the raptor, uh, carnivore, serpent creature, then you can see it in any drawing. I mean, I've got uh, images on Eskimos have, have uh, carved on their hunting bows that shows this this uh, ten-legged giant crocodile-looking thing with a huge mouthful of teeth, 
and a human being in the mouth, and the scale would be if, if my arm was this kind of thing with all these legs coming down, this big oh claw mouth, the human is about that big. So in other words, you know, then you say, well, how could the Eskimos ever have had experience with even big li li lizards? Yeah. They don't exist in the Arctic, but yet they do, and they draw them. And it's where, and I keep getting back, the only way I can explain it is because it's, it's up here. here. It's up here. And when they want to depict uh, big terror or big power, is that this is the, this is the biggest thing they've got, which which equates terror and power as this dragon. This is fascinating. You have received m much attention, much press because of this. Why do you think that is? I th I think it is is, is exactly for the reason that, that uh, I'm, I wrote the book is that the. Uh, People of the press also are involved <laughs> with the dragon. We're all involved <laughs> with the dragon. You know, it's like I, it's like I mentioned in the book. Uh, if you were to say to people today, "Do you think dragons are real?" They'd say no and smile at you. But the reality of the I'm not talking about the reality of believing that there were dragons out there going around and tearing down castles and capturing fair maidens. I just mean this fascination we have with the image of the dragon. You can walk through any shopping mall, for example, yeah. and you go past a store that has like candles went on. It'll have little dragons with little candle holders and little crystal dragons. Uh, if you go online and you just type in dragon, you're also going to hit hundreds and hundreds of sports teams all over the world have the name dragon. Uh, boat racing in China is called dragon boat racing. Uh, I, I think today, in fact, there's, there's probably more references and more images of dragons than probably in, in all of history. Hmm. Why do you think that is? And they're not all they're not all evil dragons. There's some like you know, um, you know dragon tales like a, a children's cute, show. Yeah. Cute. Yeah. <laughs> that's now that's interesting. Is that um, what what seems to be the situation is that is that, that the, the, the danger of the dragon increases uh, in inverse proportion to social complexity, which means what, that, okay. what I'm just trying to get at here, <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> uh, what I'm trying to get at here is that when, when the state arises, I, I found that the, the, the attitude about the dragon relates to the complexity of society. And when the state comes into, into play, what happens is the king, the leader of the state, begins to co-opt the power of the dragon. Mm -hmm. So like, it, let's say in, in the UK, uh, Uther Pendragon is King Arthur, say. Mm -hmm. his, on his shield, on the Welsh shields and flags are red dragons. It means that I, I am, and further, my god, this is another thing too, is that the dragon is often associated with evil, which is defeated by the good god, and the good god is basically backing the king, you see. so. Uh, what happens then is that when you run into uh, a nice dragon, what you run into, what, uh, what I guarantee you're dealing with is in some way a state level society, a society that has very powerful secular authority. Then the dragon becomes the pet of the king or the pet of children. Mm -hmm. But in societies that are pre state, chiefdoms, uh, early kingdoms, tribes, that's where you find the dragon that's a danger, very, very dangerous. So, it's like as, as if we, we tame ourselves and we become states, we also begin to tame the dragon. Why? Because we are the dragon. Are you surprised at all that you become an expert now in dragons? I'm totally surprised. I mean, uh, well, th th I wrote this book because of the question students would ask me. And, um, and uh, they would be interested in writing a research paper of some kind, for example, and, I'd and they'd say, well, can I write about dragons? And I mean, I'm an anthropologist, so you know anything's fair game, basically. <laughs> so I said, "What do you like? What?" And she says, "Well, there are dragons in China and dragons in England, mm -hmm. and uh, same dragon." And then she says, "Doctor Jones, uh, what do you suppose that is?" And blank, I have no yeah. idea. I don't. I don't know. So it kind of set it in my head that that I also once this this student sort of said, "Why?" and I couldn't answer her. Is I started thinking about. The, uh, the, uh, the Maya had a, a being called Kul Kul Khan, which is a flying serpent. And then I, I started leafing through my files in my brain, and the Hopi Indians had Palulu Khan, which is a great horned serpent that flies. Mm. Um, and then I, it's, it's like, then I started thinking about the Chinese dragon and whatnot. And that, but what I found was that the Chinese dragon comes across as beneficent. It's a bringer of rain. It's very seldom hmm. dangerous. It is the image of the emperor. I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. 
Very nice guy, that dragon. At the same time in England, the dragon is the turn of villages. Why? Because China was more evolved socially than England was at the same time. So it isn't that they're good and bad dragons. It is that the dragon image basically reflects some need of people and is defined based on whether they are a very complicated sort of state-level society with a singular leader at the top and hierarchy of people, or whether they are a tribal society. And so at the time that the Chinese were evolving the civil service system, for example, which they invented, the people in, uh, in Britain were still bashing each other in the head with stone axes. Well, now, you know, in America, many of the dragons are depicted as being very dark, very satanic in nature. Well, this is um, the, the w one of the uses where the dragon is also picked up. I mean, the dragon is, my first interest is why we have it. And then all this mm -hmm. you're talking about here are ways that, are, that the dragon is used. Yeah, right. All right, so what happens is, is in the rise of the state, uh, in it, whether China, you can pick China, or you can pick uh, Europe, or pick the UK, is that there is a state religion that goes along mm -hmm. with this. In other words, the rise of the, the states uh, of uh, the kingdoms and whatnot of Europe and England were Christian. Well, they couldn't, I mean, you can't have a, a, a power out there bigger than the God of the Christians. So you have to have you have to have a way to defeat it to prove that your God is better than all the evil of the world. And so the devil becomes associated, or Satan becomes associated with the dragon. And the slayers of the dragon uh, become the, the knights who go on the quest for the Holy Grail and are holy people. And uh, they evoke their God as they go to war against the dragon. And they always win, therefore their God is superior, therefore their knights are superior, therefore their king is superior. And it's and also makes for good movies. <laughs> yes, and we know not, why <laughs> because we're all ready to see this movie. That's you know, right. oh, I mean, you've seen you know people make movies and Godzilla and all these yes. things. It's just it's amazing when you start getting into it. This, this creature is everywhere. Yeah. And but yet, one author called it the creature that never was, the monster that never was, because the idea of the of the dragon, you know, of our of our uh, books and stuff like this. Um, there's th that thing has never been found, and we've you know we've been digging up bones forever and ever and ever. But but I also think in my, in my book I also explain some other things that the dragon always turns out to be. It has it has a, a way to kill or discomfort with its breath. Now people say well f dragons breathing fire, but some dragons like the we we have the word gargle for example in the English language. It comes from gargoyle. And these are uh, the, these kind of dragon-esque creatures that in, in medieval times they'd put on the edges of buildings and they were rain spouts. And the water would come out their mouth, you know, like this. Mm. So, and it comes from, they call them gar gargoyles because there was this creature called the gargoyle who was a French dragon, a type of dragon who would occasionally flood the countryside but just from its mouth would come out the water and flood the countryside. In some cases, they, they blow out steam. In some cases, they blow out poison fumes and stuff like this. But all dragons will have some focus on the mouth and the breath as a killer in some way. Dragons also, wherever you find them, are, are particularly antagonistic towards young, unmarried women. <laughs> That's true. I mean, it's like everywhere you find the story of the dragon, there's going to be a dragon who's captured or coming after or is threatening a young woman, an unmarried woman, and childless woman. And why woman. is that? Because my theory says, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, the weak, question. The weak versus says, the strong. No, it's, yeah. it's the next generation. You see, if you can basically take all the unmarried women and kill them off, where, where is the next generation going to come from? I mean, in other words, the, the ultimate monster I is see. the one who will kill you, not only you, but your generations. Take over the world. And yeah. so this, this woman becomes the, the symbol of the generations, and so there, she's attacked. Um, dragons also tend to have spots. I mean, it's kind of when you get into the descriptions. This is very deep stuff. I mean, when you well, started getting into this, did yeah. you say, wow, there's more to this than I thought? Oh, yeah. When I first started out, I didn't know where it would go because I had no theory. But um, the, this student asked me a question, which sort of set up a question in my own mind. Mm -hmm. And then the Howler Monkey stuff, which I was doing for something else, suddenly connected with, with uh, the question. So the students provide me with, why are the Chinese dragons like uh, not like English dragons? And then the study of the primates connects me with the the the, uh, the raptor, the snake, and the cat as these innate fears of howler monkeys, li like our ancient ancestors. We're not from monkeys, but we're from the same kind of creature. We're certainly not birds, and we're certainly not turtles. We're tree climbing creatures like this. 
So it just all comes together at that point. Then as I got into it, uh, like I found, for example, that dragons are, are tend to be depicted with talons. You know, dragons will generally have horns, I mean, of some kind. They either have a crest or they'll have just horns sticking out of their head for no apparent reason, you know. Well, this was, this was really a switch for you because you have been previously writing about Native American Indians. Well, s sort of in a sense, but the Native American Indians, uh, likewise, uh, I was studying the Comanches, for example, when I was in graduate school in Oklahoma, and they have a creature called Pilmopites, which they threaten their children with. You know, it's, it's like a monster of the night, and uh, it's a great And they big threaten their children with this? <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, it's really interesting. The Comanches <laughs> don't physically uh, discipline their children. What they'll do is, like, if it's at night and the kids are running around inside the house making a lot of noise, they'll say, quiet down, quiet down. The kids don't quiet down. So they say, okay, making noise is good for you. It helps your lungs and everything, but it's not something you do in the house. You do it outside the house, so let's go outside. Well, they also, Grandma's been telling this little kid stories about Pia Mopitz, who wanders the night looking for little mm -hmm. children, you know, like this, you know. <laughs> And what's interesting is this I've big done something uh, like that. Uh, it's, the, it's the boogeyman strategy. <laughs> yeah, uh, all right. of a sudden, the kid gets real interested in being still <laughs> and quiet, right? right? Yeah. The other thing, though, is the talon business. Is Pio Mopitz is depicted as leaving a three-taloned print. So it's again, it's this thing about the the like a giant bird. Sometimes they equate it with an owl, a giant owl. But I mean, the fear of the child is the is the bird image of this thing. It's fascinating. I want you to talk about this. In fact. Uh, tell us about Santa Pia. Mm -hmm. Tell us about her. Uh, I met her when I was in Oklahoma. I was working for the American Indian Institute, and uh, I went around to would go around to various powwows or gatherings of the Southern Plains Indians. Uh, and I was at a powwow uh, of the uh, Kiowa, Kiowa Apache, and Comanche out near Chickasha, Oklahoma. And I met her son, and or her grandson was about 11 years old, and his name was Sheshe. And uh, the, the, when, when you go to these p real powwows, like a lot of times the Indian kids will come over and say, hey, who are you? And are you Jesse James? And I mean, you know, just playing around with you like that. <laughs> They're curious. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, um, and so this little boy named Sheshe, you know, would come and he'd stand beside me. And uh, we're, I, we're sitting watching the dances and whatnot, you know. And then he would say, can I get you, can I get some Coke? And, and I said, yeah, so I'd give him money and he'd get a Coke and get me a Coke. And then he'd sit there and he'd stand beside me. You know, he sort of adopted me as the, you know, I was his source of Coke. And also, he had tremendous knowledge. He was about 12 years old of what was going on, the symbols and, oh, uh, this is horse stealing dance, he would say, you know. And this is round dance and, you know, like this. And so it's cool. So one afternoon he says, why he said, I want you to come home and have lunch with me. Now, the, 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 the Indian people that I was around are, are poor. I mean, really poor. Uh, if you're living in a house with like Comanches, traditional Comanches, you wake up in the morning, there's nothing in the house to eat. The first thing mm. you think about is, uh, what are we going to get food? Mm -hmm. So when somebody, a little kid says, come and eat, this is a real important thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, and so, and he was very, sort of a little boy that was more dignified than most little boys. I mean, he was a very striking character. So I, I met him on the dance ground at noon, and we went, he led me back into his encampment. And uh, I noticed that as we walked back in these teepee camps, that I was in the Comanche contingent. And the, I'd been warned about Comanches. People said, those people are really rough. You know, they, you know, they're trying to scare me. You know? They said, nobody deals with the Comanches. And so I, th I figured, you know, what the heck. You know? So he, he leads me through this teepee encampment until we hit this opening. And, he, and then I look up, and there's this woman, looks like about 300-pound woman, uh, Indian woman. And there's this, this big wrought iron kettle, and she's, she's, she's got this big paddle in the kettle, and just steam's coming off this kettle, and her hair's hanging down her face, and her face is all flushed and red, and, uh, and, and you know, long hair hanging down like this. And it was the image of the witch. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, bubble, 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 mm -hmm. toil and trouble, you know, mm -hmm. she's just, mm -hmm. and when I come walking into that clearing in front of her, she just looks at me and just like, like, you know, <laughs> what are you doing here, you know? And uh, then it was the little boy says to her in Comanche, which I didn't figure this out until about a couple months later when I knew something. He introduced me as Nahites. He says, Nabiapia Nahites, uh, Big Mama, he says to her grandma, this is my. And now, in the old Comanche way, Heights was war brother. It meant like if you call a guy Heights, Nahites, my Heights. 
it meant you, like he's my war brother, like we go into battle in the buddy system and we maybe even loan each other money or we help mm. each other in courtship in the heights. But to the modern Comanches, it just means male friend. Okay. All right. So Shea Shea is a modern Comanche, so he says basically in the heights. All right, but the old lady is an uh, old time Comanche, so she hears brother. Well, it m made her have to get into a relationship with me because of what her grandson I called see. me. Yeah. Say. And so it meant, it meant at least she had to offer me something to eat because of this brother relationship. You know, and so um, I realized that she was kind of tense, you know, about being there. And, I, and she said, she looks around and she says, you sit there. And I, she made me sit in a place where none of the other Indians in the area could see me. She was kind of embarrassed to have me in her camp. And uh, so I, I sit down, I'm just watching this. And Shea Shea is saying, Grandma, Grandma, uh, tell, tell Nahait some coyote stories. And, and then the old lady would say, Ah, oh, he's, he's a big grown-up man. He doesn't want to hear any kid stories. And the little boy would say, yes, he does. Tell him, tell him, tell him. And so this is a typical thing of here's grandma. And of course, the little grandson is, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's Pofa Bill. Look at you here. Yeah, you look like yeah. an actor. <laughs> no, that's, they used to come up to me and told me I looked like Jesse James. Jesse James. Yeah. <laughs> and anyway, uh, so he, the little, boy, little grandson keeps saying, tell the story, tell the story. And, and of course, the grandmother just dotes on this little boy. So he says, she says, well, OK, you know. And so I came back that night uh, after dinner. And she again, uh, Santa Pia again, stuck me someplace where I couldn't be seen. You know, and then she starts telling stories. And then once she started telling the story and the fire's crackling and you, know, you hear the dancing, you know, doom, 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 hey, uh, hey, uh, off in the distance. And she's telling about the two hunters that went out in the mountains. And one of them, when they came back at night, they were cooking their meat. And the guy was cutting meat, and he accidentally cut a piece off his hand, and he ate it. And it was the best meat he'd ever eaten. And then he gradually begins to realize he's eating himself. And then he decides, well, it's really good. So he waits till his partner goes off hunting, and then he sits and starts cooking up his arm and stuff like that. You know, just a crazy story. But while she was talking to me that night, she let it slip. Uh, the, uh, she suddenly said in Comanche, Pujocate. And I said, I said what, what's that? Oh, and she, she kind of looked at me, and she rocked her head, and she said, uh, Puja, power. She said, Cate, mm. women who have. And I said, w w what kind of power? And she says, power to heal. And so she was basically had let slip. And later, in later years, I didn't know whether she really l let this slip or whether she just had planned all this. But she basically was telling me she was a shaman. She was a healer. Mm -hmm. And um, after the right. camp broke up, I asked her if I could come and visit her sometime and talk to her about herb medicines. And uh, then over the about three years, I spent you know, a lot of time with her and interviewed her. And what's really nice- And written a couple of books about her. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, you have several books, David. You have one that's um, fascinating, Women Warriors, A History. Uh, I have hung on every word. Your stories are intriguing. Thank you so much. We are out of time. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> I know. Already. <laughs> I have enjoyed this. And again, Dr. Jones's book is called An Instinct for Dragons, and he's got one called Women Warriors, A History, which is also fascinating. Thank you so much for watching our show today, UCF in Print. I'm Alice Collier. Until next time, goodbye.